Yes. Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the first program in our seventh year of existence. When we started this, uh, we didn't expect that we will come this far. Uh, but we are here today and uh, we would like to thank all of our audience and uh, people who are part of our WhatsApp group and people who have reached out to us for where we are today. Without uh, you, your uh, support, we wouldn't be here. So thank you very much for it. And uh, this is Madras month, if I can call that, okay? And uh, we are in our lecture 68, and uh, this is about a very popular book called The Chip War. And uh, this, why this book is popular and all those things, uh, I would uh, leave it to the speaker to uh, talk about. And coming to the speaker, Jatayu, uh, Shankar Narayanan is our speaker today and uh, uh, he wears many hats. He is a scholar in Tamil and Sanskrit. He, write, he is a prolific writer and uh, he also wears a other hat as per his profession. He is a semiconductor uh, or a chip. This, he comes from a chip designing semiconductor conductor background and he has been in this industry for the last 25 years and he has uh, managed techno functional positions and uh, we thought he would be the best guy to talk about this subject which has garnered a lot of attention in Varayamira Science Forum itself a uh, few years back we had uh, Professor Kamakodi talk about the uh, Sakti processor Professor Kamakodi now is the director of IIT Madras so and uh, we have we have always been interested in this uh, aspect of semiconductors and recently our prime minister has also been talking a lot about this and uh, there have been policy changes which focus a lot on semiconductors uh, chips manufacturing and uh, covid told us why chips are very important more than anything else okay so without much ado i hand it over to shankaran narayanan Jadayu for his talk. Over to you, Jadayu. Yeah. Thank you, Ramanan, for that uh, introduction. Yeah. Um, yeah. One one trivia uh, that got missed in the introduction was that uh, I graduated uh, in electronics and communication engineering in 1993 from Sri Venkateshwara College of Engineering in your own city where the science forum is located, Chennai. And uh, uh, incidentally, the project guide of uh, Professor Kamakoti, uh, Professor Venkateswaran, I also did my engineering project under him. You know, so there is some connection between uh, on that front. Okay. And uh, I have been in the industry actually for about 30 years now. So in 1993, I started working just after my graduation. Let me share my presentation for the day. So uh, I will run through this. And uh, any questions that you have, please reserve it till the end of the presentation. Uh, I think there is some good Q&A time. Uh, so this talk is about a very popular book, Chip War. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, is there any problem, uh, Jatayu? Is everything no, no. fine? Yeah, fine. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so chips, as all of you know, are the world's most crucial technology today. So this has become uh, very crucial for our lives, chip, chip technology. Everything runs on chips, computers, smartphones, medical equipment, internet, 
industrial assemblies, money transfer, stock market, missiles, you know, Chandrayaan, whatever you name it, right? So, so even uh, the, the presentations that we are having right now has been made possible uh, by a lot of technologies and predominantly the chip technology uh, uh, as, as we all know. Not just that, uh, today's military, economic, and geopolitical power, it is built on a foundation of semiconductor chip. See, normally uh, we, we talk about technology as a general term, and there are, there are many, many crucial technologies under that basket. And uh, semiconductors are normally, it's a technology that's not very visible. Um, at the at the outer level, but it is very very foundational and important. Okay, so if you look at the exponential growth of chip technology in the past decades, it's very interesting. Uh, in 1971, that's when the first commercial microprocessor, Intel 4004, was introduced. It had just about 2,300 transistors which itself was a great thing at that time. And it was running at a speed less than 100 megahertz. It had very basic computing, okay? In the same year, your super fast uh, Ferrari car was running at uh, 280 kmph speed. And the tallest building was at that height, 1,300 feet. So come to the present times, we have the Intel 9 processor, the 13th gen processor. It has 4.2 billion transistors. Just, just imagine that number. And, and it's running at six gigahertz speeds and beyond. And the kind of advanced and complex computing that it is capable of, you know, someone can actually run a small AI engine in a laptop. Uh, a, a, a small one, though, though, though not you know, very complicated and uh, mass use kind of thing. That kind of comp computing capability it has got. And just compare this with the growth rate in cars and buildings. <laughs> you know? so, so if the, if the building technology, if the car uh, technology had grown at this rate, we would actually have cars running almost like half of the speed of light. Uh, and the buildings would perhaps touch the moon. <laughs> okay. So just to give another interesting point, so today's smartphone, it's more powerful and much, much smaller than the 1980s university computers. Uh, if you have uh, if you have seen those old computers of the 1980s, late 1980s. They used to occupy whole room and uh, they needed constant pooling and everything. Uh, and today's smartphone is much more powerful than that. This book, Chip War, the fight for the world's most critical technology. Uh, this was published uh, last year, uh, October, 2022. It has already received a lot of acclaim. Uh, it's, it's being called as the best written chronicle of the rise and growth of the semiconductor industry. It explains how the economic, geopolitical, and technological forces together shaped this industry. So, so a whole new industry got created and how it came about. So that this book explains. The book's author, Chris Miller, he's an economic historian essentially. Uh, if you look at his credentials, he's a professor of international history, and he's a visiting fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. He's a Eurasia research director. So you see a lot of you know, security, defense, and geopolitics written over his profile. But still, th this book uh, is very important for science enthusiasts, business leaders, business enthusiasts, even general readers as such, okay? So it is uh, called a nonfiction thriller 
uh, it's written in a very engaging, easy, and entertaining style. It's keenly discussed by largely by defense and security experts, policymakers, and the business uh, analysts. And as if you see the book cover, uh, there is a clear, you know, the, the book is written predominantly from an American perspective. Uh, the, the author is an American. And uh, so though, though this, is, this is really a history of a global industry and a global phenomenon, the perspective is predominantly American. Uh, that's, that's, it's very important to keep this in mind while reading through this book. And uh, before you know, giving a detailed introduction to the book, I will delve a little bit on the basics of the chip technology in a few slides so that uh, you can appreciate the book, uh, the, the talk as well as the book. You know, th though the author is an economic historian, uh, I am a technology professional and this is a science forum. So, so I thought, uh, you know, the listeners will be very interested uh, in the technical details also. Uh, apart from the core subject of the book. Okay, some basics. So what are semiconductors? So essentially, semiconductor is a material. Uh, as, as the name itself suggests, you know, we, we, are, we are all familiar with insulators and conductors, right, the basic science. So semiconductor is a material that can conduct a small amount of uh, electric current so that's why it's called semiconductor. And this is due to uh, the unique electron structure, you know, that's atomic physics of this, these materials called semiconductors. And as you know, silicon is the most popular semiconductor material, as we all know. And there are other materials like uh, germanium, gallium, ar arsenide, silicon carbide, et cetera. And uh, just like in metallurgy, you cannot make much useful things with the pure gold, right? So many other metals and minerals are added to, to make alloys. Uh, even the Panchaloha uh, statues are made with such alloys. So in a similar manner, uh, the pure, in a, though the pure silicon is a semiconductor material, nothing much can be just done with that. So some impurities, that's actually a technical term. You know, it's not just the English word. The impurities are introduced into it. Uh, it is called doping in technical language. So these impurities, uh, it causes the silicon crystal to become slightly unstable, okay? the, the crystal structure. So that results in a free movement of electrons Otherwise, uh, a crystal is a very stable uh, component, right? So this mild instability causes the free movement of electrons. And this imbalance of electrons, it generates positive and negative charges. And that's how a semiconductor becomes a electronic device. Okay? So, so in this method, you can create semiconductor devices. And in this, a lot of material science, physics, and chemistry is involved in basic semiconductors, really. So coming to uh, transistors, I'm sure many of you are familiar with what a transistor is. It's a miniature semiconductor device. If I, if I just, if I have to give a very high level idea, it, it regulates or controls current or voltage, essentially, voltage flow. That's what a transistor is. And uh, if you really look at it, there are only two major functionality of, for a transistor. One is an, as an amplifier. The other is as a switch. You know, it, it, can, it can amplify a, a signal or it can act as a switch. The moment when I say switch, I'm sure uh, you are relating it to binary logic, so zero and one, uh, which, is, uh, which is at the 
foundation of all com computing. So a transistor essentially becomes a, a switch that can represent a bit or a binary digit. And if you literally put thousands and lakhs of transistors, you can represent huge uh, uh, binary data and of course build a computing machine. So the, the other key thing is about analog and digital. This is very, very basic. I'm sure all of you know it, but still uh, let me just touch, touch base with it so that, uh, see, everything in the real world is analog as you all know, you know like, like these waveforms that you see, uh, continuous waveforms, whether uh, you take audio or video, uh, any, any human uh, interface that, that we use with digital devices. Essentially, it is all analog. But with analog, you cannot really do much. So you need to uh, so, so let us say I speak in a microphone, right? So the, the, the acoustic energy gets converted into electrical energy and you really have a, a, a electrical signals present. Okay, you can, you can record it in some device and you can replay it, but can't do anything much beyond that. But if you sample this audio signal, you know, at a regular interval, at discrete interval, and make it into a digital signal, right? You can represent it with ones and zeros, and then you can store it. So you can store it as a MP3 file, for example. You can edit it. You can do all kinds of processing in it. So, so the moment any, any natural you know, input uh, from the real world gets converted into a digital data, you can do all kinds of processing with it. So that is the power of digital technology. And obviously, if you really look at today's chip, 97% of them, uh, it varies, but predominantly about 95 to 97% of it is all digital. And only the remaining portion is analog. Okay? So, but analog is very, very crucial because without analog, you just can't interface with the real world. But then, uh, so you can, in a sense, you can compare this uh, with the human body. So you have multiple uh, organs and ultimately everything goes to the brain. And all, uh, you know, intelligent processing happens in the brain in the form of neurons. So, so the digital logic can be compared to that in a sense. So if you look at the evolution of chips, so originally there were discrete components like resistor, capacitor, and then we came to what is called amplifiers, diodes, transistors. And very soon we had integrated circuits or what is called an IC, which is, which is what is called a chip. And then we had general purpose ICs and application specific ICs. Uh, they were called ASIC. And now what we have is system on a chip. So the whole system is uh, in a chip. Again, some more basics. So, so I have, you know, I, I'm making the slides a bit more uh, uh, incrementally complex so that, you know, we can, we can appreciate. So, so some of you may be wondering why the chips are getting bigger and bigger because your understanding of hardware in any system is that, okay, you have a processor, you have some chip, and then most of the thing is done by the software. So why the chips are getting bigger and bigger and more and more complex over time? So that's because the applications are getting more and more complex, right? And the hardware needs to uh, get scaled to really make that possible. So for example, you, you take MP, uh, MPEG-4 video recording. So you have uh, high resolution cameras now in all the smartphones, right? So the cameras capture the image data. So it comes as pixels ultimately, right? So the RGB, red, green, blue pixels. And obviously there is humongous number of pixels that 
without a proper way of uh, encoding them and compressing them, you cannot store a lot of these pixels. So the MPEG-4 standard evolved to address that problem. So, so it gives you a, a kind of algorithm to encode and compress these video pixels. So that's how it gets stored. So that becomes a digital data. Uh, so that involves, let us say, many, many mathematical operations like discrete cosine transform, for example. And then when you have to play back that video, you have to decompress and decode. Okay. So you have to do the inverse of what you did. So, so while encoding, if you did discrete cosine transform, you have to do inverse discrete cosine transform while playing back. And if you are running all these algorithms in software, which is technically possible, right? So you, you can actually implement the whole MPEG-4 algorithm. You can take raw pixels and implement the entire MPEG-4 algorithm in software. So that's how we used to do it about uh, 20 years back. So it will be very slow. Uh, so the shaky video playback and all that was due to that. So then you move this entire processing to hardware so that it is faster, okay? So in a similar manner, the, the more real time you want the applications to be and faster and scale, you know, you, let us say instead of one camera, you have actually feed coming from five cameras and you want to process all of this in parallel. Obviously you need four hardware uh, modules working on these video feeds. So this is how the chip complexity keeps increasing. Uh, based to, to as per the demands of applications and systems. So today's chips, they can be and include processors, controllers, accelerators, specialized engines, memory, lots of it, and analog, mixed signal, and sensors. So what I mean by mis mixed signal, typically it's a term used for analog to digital conversion and digital to analog conversion. And power related components, RF is radio frequency. So, so in all the mobile phone, you have RF components. So here is the block diagram of the Snapdragon uh, 810 chip, uh, which some of you may be familiar with. It is a chip from Qualcomm that you will find it in your smartphones. So if you see this main chip, uh, so it has this, are Cortex A57. So these, these are processors. This is a memory. Uh, so these are all those special engines which I talked about, the multimedia processing, modems, display. Uh, there is a GPU, graphics processing unit, and the GPS. So all this is digital, essentially, okay? And with this chip alone, you cannot build a smartphone solution and you need um, companion chips. So you have audio codecs. So this NFC, uh, the, the wireless LAN, transmit receive chips, Bluetooth, you have power management, you have radio frequency chips which connect to the modem. So together, they kind of give you an integrated solution for mobile phone. So I just showed you that block diagram. So how do you take that concept to silicon, right? So that's, that's essentially what is making chips all about. So, so you start with a concept which eventually gets converted into what is called a chip layout. I'll talk about this process later in the presentation. So it becomes, once, it, once you can generate a chip layout, you can give it to a fab which will manufacture it. And then you can uh, assemble the packaged chip and it gets into this form. And as you see the components in this block diagram, physically, you can actually identify them in a chip layout, just that it, uh, it looks very, 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 uh, it's like, you know, uh, it looks very nice and colorful, but what exactly this is about? So it is the multi-layered circuit pattern which is to be fabricated inside the chip. 
So that's what this layout represents. Okay. So so there are many stages involved in this. So first stage is the design where uh, the chip designs are created. So this is mainly done in uh, the semiconductor companies or you could even, it can happen in what is, uh, okay, I'll come to these, some of these details in later slide. Essentially design is the first step, okay? Where, where you really created uh, this concept and then ultimately you produce a chip layout from it. There is a lot of automation involved in it, of course. It's not a manual process, okay? I'll talk about it later. And so once the design is complete, it is it goes to the fab and it gets manufactured, okay? So, so there are complex and extensive series of steps in manufacturing, and this happens in the foundries. So there are, so in the first step, you have the silicon wafers, and the, from the silicon wafers, you create individual chips. And then the chips are assembled and they are packaged. So in a form, they get into a form where it can be mounted on a board and used in a system. Okay? And then they get integrated. So this typically happens in the device manufacturing companies. Okay, So where in the end product, the chips get integrated uh and ultimately they reach the customers us where uh, it could be a, a mobile phone or a pc or the chips can go inside the car or servers uh anything all this okay largest semiconductor companies in the world so if you see this list, you can identify some of them. I'll anyway go through this. So TSMC is Taiwanese semiconductor manufacturing company. So this is a company that only manufactures chips, okay? It doesn't do any design. It, the whole company is focused on manufacturing chips that are designed by other companies. And that is the largest in this industry. The next is Samsung, as you know. So Samsung is a kind of company which can be called IDM, Integrated Device Manufacturer. So Samsung makes chips. Samsung also makes you know, phones and other uh, end products. So the chips made by Samsung go into their products and also into the products made by other companies. So, so it, it's a chip as well as a device manufacturer. Intel, as you, you all know, Intel inside. So it makes processors that go into your laptops and all other computing. Qualcomm, I'm sure you have heard this name, uh, predominantly uh, telecom and mobile component uh, chips is what they make. SK Hynix is uh, South Korea Hynix. So it's a, it is the largest manufacturer of memory chips, which are called DRAM, uh, dynamic RAM. That's the company. And Broadcom makes uh, all the Wi-Fi uh, related chips and also networking switches, routers, the server components. Micron is again a memory chip vendor. And NVIDIA, uh, it originally started out as a graphics company. Uh, making what is called GPU, gra graphics processing unit chips. But now uh, NVIDIA is the company that creates the chips that go into uh, the artificial intelligence, uh, you know, the, the high power uh, artificial intelligence processing hardware. So it's one of the fastest growing and highly valued companies. And Applied Materials is a semiconductor equipment manufacturing company. So they don't make chips. They make the equipments that are used to manufacture chips. 
And Texas Instruments, one of the oldest of the chip companies, they make a lot of analog and power related uh, components, sensors, stuff like that. And uh, I have worked in two of these companies as an employee, uh, you know, NVIDIA and Texas Instruments. And I have done projects for Intel and Qualcomm, uh, uh, you know, in an outsourced manner. So as you see, it's kind of a small world. Uh, so in my 25 years of uh, career in this industry, I have been associated with four of these companies directly, almost directly. So it's a very close knit kind of an industry. Okay, so this slide can be very intimidating uh, how chips are made. So you can you can go to Google or YouTube and uh, you know you, you remember to use the word semiconductor uh, otherwise you might end up with potato chip making videos. Uh, you, you can search how semiconductor chips are made and there are there are wonderful videos explaining the whole process. But I have still put this because so uh, it involves uh, very complex and extensive steps. A lot of this is material science, physics, chemistry, optics, precision, machine tooling, and stuff like that. Okay, so we start with the silicon wafer. Uh, as you see, th th that looks very nice. You know, you might be wondering. So silicon is sand. So how come it is so smooth? So the so even to get into this first step, silicon wafer, there are a lot of steps. So the sand is, uh, the industrial quality sand is melted and it's made into a liquid. It is made into, and then solidified, uh, crystallized into a cylindrical form. And these wafers are sliced out of that. So that's how we get into that start step. And once we have this silicon wafer, uh, you know, the, the so the chips are sliced out of this wafer, like the way you make Mysore Park. So you 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 pour uh, that Mysore Park of the after you take it out of the oven, you you pour it into a circular plate, and the way you slice it with a knife, making some nice square shaped Mysore Parks. That's how the chips are sliced out of this wafer. Okay, so once you got the wafer. And uh, uh, there are some steps to, to prepare it. And a, a, a layer called oxidation. So, so a, a oxide film layer is coated on this uh, wafer surface. And then, so what you have to really put it on, on each of these chip is that chip layout, right? You, you remember that? So that's a very complex pattern. So, so think of that. Uh, as a as a very complex geometrical pattern so that circuit needs to be drawn and at the nanometer scale right so 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 uh, if you are talking about uh, uh, talking of the dimensions the size of a wafer is typically the diameter is 12 inch uh, 300 millimeter that's the diameter of a typical silicon wafer and the thickness would be about 750 micrometer. Okay, it's very thin. So in such a 12 inch wafer, if you, if you have a 10 mm cross 10 mm, 10 mm chips, so 100 mm squared, you can get something like 640 uh, chips out of that 12 inch wafer. Okay, so in, in each of that 10 mm cross 10 mm square, you have to draw the circuit pattern of the whole chip, okay? So that's what this process photolithography does. So it's exactly like, you know, lithography, which is used in printing, just that it is done at such a small scale with what is called extreme ultraviolet rays. Uh, I will discuss about it into the, further into the talk. So once that circuit pattern is drawn, so the unwanted portion, uh, which is lying, it is removed away. That's what is called etching. And once that is done, uh, there is some implantation. 
so you remember in the in the while talking about semiconductors i talked about doping so it's essentially that process so that happens and then when you have multiple transistors billions of transistors uh, which have been formed through the drawing pattern they need to be connected and the connection is through metal at such such precision dimension so there is a metal deposition step to connect the components and then there is a polishing and eds so that's uh, energy energy dispersive spectroscopy which is like a testing process to to just make sure that uh, everything is all right in the chip right and once that is done uh, the the individual chips are diced away and and each chip that is called a die you know the the pack, the chip before packaging it is called a die and then the wires are attached to that die because the chip needs to sit into a board and connect to the rest of the system so that's what is wire bonding and then uh, the final package is put on the final cover is put on top of that and then there, there is some further testing uh, to to make sure everything all right everything is all right and the chips that don't qual qualify through this testing are discarded okay and then they are packaged and that's the finished chip so there are uh, major processes involved in this uh, this this slide is just to you know recapture so you have a pre treatment so this is how the silicon um, the, the cylinders which i spoke about they are called ingots okay so this is how it looks like and wafers are sliced out of that so wafer cutting cleaning drying and then there is lithography uh, so which is drawing the circuit edge rounding uh, implantation process etching so when you when you come to this uh, yeah so along with this wafers so you also need the design right so, so this is the logic design so from the logic design ultimately you produce i i mentioned about layout so from the layout you produce what is called a mask you know see it's a photolithography process right so so the term mask is used so that mask is what is used to draw the circuit pattern in the photolithography process so that is also fed as an input um and then uh there are some other chemical processes and ultimately it is packaged and assembled okay now we come into the um book so whatever slides that you see with this logo uh, it's taken from the book directly okay so with this technical background uh, that i gave you till now you can appreciate some of the things said in this book uh, in a more informed manner okay so the the book is a it's a eight part book uh, i will i have put one slide for each part so that i can summarize uh, the contents of the book in a crisp manner so the first part uh, is called cold war chips so this really talks about the dawn of the semiconductor industry so during the post world war uh, time the industrial developments predominantly the, the thrust was on electronics and computation that's natural because the war got over and so much technology is got developed during the war so that had a lot of other potential so then electronics really picked up and it all started with what is called vacuum tube circuits you know which is even before the transistor so th this is what is called valve right so valve radio uh, you know in olden times so this valve radios they were all um, so the devices made out of these va valve radios they used to glow like light bulbs okay so uh, in places where these devices were used it used to attract insects so the insects used to come and uh, sit on those vacuum tubes making the device malfunction 
So then a technician needs to go and remove those insects from those valves. This process was called debugging. See, that's where this term comes from. Okay, so we, we use it till today uh, in, in all of our uh, software and hardware technical work. So that's where it comes from. So quickly, we moved, thank, uh, thankfully, we moved away from the vacuum tube circuits uh, to transistors based on semiconductor. In 1948, uh, William Shockley was the inventor. And a couple of years after that, the integrated circuit was invented by Jack KV uh, and Bob Noyce. They shared the Nobel Prize for this, uh, I think, in the year 2003 uh, or something. Um, great invention, essentially. So with integrated circuit, one could put multiple transistors. You know, a, a circuit consists of multiple transistors. All that into one single component in an integrated manner. And that started the chip revolution, really. So Fairchild Semiconductors uh, was the company that got founded at that time. So they were, it, it, were, it created uh, some components for NASA and also the Apollo mission. Texas Instruments created some early chips for American Air Force. And the book has some very interesting anecdotes. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have time to, uh, you know, uh, mention them uh, in such short talk about the, the, the crazy and interesting personalities of some of these guys like Shockley and Bob Noyce. Uh, very interesting. Um, okay, what is the circuitry of the American world? That's the second part. So here the author talks about the 1960s uh, space race. So the USSR, uh, which wanted to compete with uh, the US, so they got into this copied strategy to set up uh, a Silicon Valley-like thing uh, in, in the Soviet Russia. It was predominantly military driven, uh, just like the, the American, you know, the semiconductor program, which also had some small consumer component, but it, that was also predominantly military. So this is how the, the Soviets uh, came into the semiconductors. And there are uh, very, very interesting uh, uh, stories of uh, espionage and uh, other things mentioned uh, in this section in the book. Japan, took an alternative kind of approach. So they, they went with what is called a license it strategy. And US was very much interested in it because, you know, because the US wrecked Japan uh, with the nuclear bombs, uh, it very much was interested uh, in playing a role uh, in, in, in to, uh, to build Japan as an industrial powerhouse. So some technologies got licensed to Japan and with its entrepreneurial spirit, consumer product like Walkman came out of Japan. And in the Vietnam War, uh, the US of course got terribly defeated because of uh, some very crazy moves. So the book talks about one, one interesting uh, anecdote where the US uh, fighter aircrafts were trying to bomb a bridge but the bombs they were throwing went all around the bridge and never on the bridge. And never, even when they fell on the bridge, they created some small craters here and there without causing any major damage to the bridge. But then the Texas instrument, one Texas instruments engineer came into the picture and he just put a laser, uh, laser beam and a small piece of silicon attached to uh, the missiles, and you know, when when 700, 800 bombs could not damage the bridge earlier, uh, the laser-guided bombs powered by microelectronics with with about 30, 40 of them, they could actually uh, bomb multiple targets. So this gave a lot of uh, Philip 
to the chip technology with the American government and the defense circles. So all the chip companies got huge funding and uh, tax breaks and uh, government support in a very big way. And quickly during this time, they offshored uh, the offshoring of a lot of electronics production to East Asian allies happened. One was the cheap labor. The other was that they, they really wanted to weaken communism and militarism in these East Asian countries. Uh, so the book has this nice uh, photograph of transistor girls. You know, this is 1970 Malaysia. So the production managers believed women's smaller hands made them better. So a lot of semiconductor assembly happened through manual work. Uh, during this time, which uh, eventually got automated more and more during the subsequent periods. Okay. So I have given some interesting quotes. <laughs> uh, by the end of 70s, American semiconductor firms employed tens of thousands of workers internationally mostly in Korea, Taiwan, Southeast Asia, a new international alliance emerged between Texan and Californian chip makers, Asian autocrats, and the often ethnic Chinese workers who staffed many of these assembly facilities. This was in the 70s. This industry was globalizing decades before anyone had even heard of the word, laying the grounds for Asia-centric supply chains which we know even today. So there's another interesting quote uh, from Gordon Moore, one of the co-founders of Intel. We are really the revolutionaries in the world today, not the kids with the long hair and beards who were wrecking the schools a few years ago. So now that we mentioned the name of Gordon Moore, I spent some time to explain Moore's law, uh, a very important phenomenon in chip technologies. See, uh, at the start, we spoke about the exponential growth of the chip, uh, the chip's capabilities, right? So Moore's law is really behind that phenomenon. So what, what Gordon Moore said in 1965 is that the number of transistors on a chip would double roughly every two years, okay? With a minimal rise in cost. So what, what's he saying here? So if a chip has, you know, 2000 transistors uh, now, after two years, it will have 4000. So like that, it will keep growing, uh, which is obviously a, a binary exponential kind of growth, right? Um, and the cost will be minimal. So, so this looks like a, a, a very simple business kind of rule, law. It's not really a law of physics or anything. So how did he arrive at this? So those who, you know, so there is a very, uh, so if you really uh, study deeply um, the electronic, uh, electron mobility, semiconductor physics. So, so ultimately the, the smaller, you can manufacture the transistor and run them at a lower voltage, okay? That consumes less power, less heat, and it, it runs at a higher speed, okay? So, as, so basically, when the transistors become smaller and smaller, this, the speed is the speed at which they operate increases and you can actually run them at a lower voltage thus saving power also so this is essentially the physics which you know based uh, on which moore's created this law and as you see in this graph so this is a graph from intel the law has uh, been proven correct over uh, the last uh, uh, 30 or more years, 40 years rather. 
So in 1970s, uh, we had just this many number of transistors. So Intel is aspiring to 1 trillion transistors in 2030. Uh, through some of these very innovative and newer uh, kind of technologies of uh, manufacturing transistors. So this number which I have uh, put here, so I actually took this graph, the yellow numbers I have put. So this is what is, uh, I'm sure many of you have heard terms like 10 nanometer technology, right? Two nanometer technology. So what exactly does it mean? So it is also called feature size. So basically this number represents the distance uh, between two terminals. Basically a, a basic, um, basic component of one single transistor. Okay. So as you see, so when you say 10 nanometer, so the basic feature size, so see uh, uh, feature in the sense, so uh, if, you, if you take a transistor, um, the transistor is a, as I said, as I told at the start, it's a, it's a miniature semiconductor component, right? So it typically has three terminals. So the, there is, there is a, a voltage terminal and there is an input and there is an output. So, Basically, you know, you have to create that structure at nanometer levels. So the smaller and smaller you create, the, the basic distance between uh, these three terminals of the transistor, if you make them very small, it gives you the benefits that I mentioned, but it also results in some other problems, like feasibility of manufacturing it reliably. So you have to solve all those problems to make Moore's law work. Okay, so uh, so that's exactly so every one of this what is called a node. So the dots that you see here, you can think of this as a semiconductor process technology node. So there is 10, 10 micrometer, and then it will be somewhere like eight micrometer, five micrometer, like that it will come one micrometer, and then it goes to nanometers, right? So 300 nanometers, 250 nanometers, it keeps reducing, comes to 65 nanometers, 10 nanometers, and now we are at two nanometer. So each of this node is accompanied by uh, multiple innovations. So it's, it's kind of beyond the scope of this talk. Even the book doesn't talk about this much because this is a very deeply technical subject involving a lot of semiconductor physics. Okay, so in this slide, uh, just the last 20 years, how, what are the technology nodes that Intel has gone through? Uh, this slide represents that. So in 2003, so, you know, they again created this, this kind of, this innovation gave 90 nanometer. And then this gave them 65 nanometer, and this took it to 45, and this to 32. Like that, it goes. Okay. And uh, we are uh, in 2022. We were at three nanometer, and beyond this, we will be in what is called the angstrom era. So angstrom uh, is 0 0.1 nanometer. Okay. So we will be talking about 20 angstroms, 18 angstroms, and which is almost uh, getting into quantum computing uh, dimensions beyond this. But the thing is that Intel thinks that at least for the next 10 years, the Moore's law will hold. Uh, so, so that's about Moore's law. Again, this is, a, this, is a, this is a very interesting and complex subject, but due to paucity of time, I'm cutting it short here. Um, so firms like uh, Intel targeted corporate computers and consumer goods, not just missiles. Only consumer markets had the volume to fund the vast R&D programs that Moore's law required. 
so this is this is a very important point uh, this book makes uh, which is very true and then he goes on to say uh, this law is only a prediction it is not a fact of physics the end of moore's law would be devastating for the semiconductor industry and for the world why because we have been fed on you know getting cheaper electronics uh, which is much more powerful every year for the last 25 years so suddenly if this honeymoon stops obviously it will be it will have a devastating effect uh, but then there is for all the talk of moves law ending there's more money than ever before flowing into the chip industry uh, okay so startups designing uh, chips optimized for ai algorithms they are raising billions of dollars each hoping that they can become the next nvidia The big tech firms like Google, Amazon, Microsoft, Apple, Facebook. Do can you associate these companies with chips? But the fact is that they are all designing their own chips now. There's clearly uh, no deficit for innovation. Okay, now I'll come back to the book. Uh, the I'll continue on the line of the book from Moore's law. So then. you know uh, after the 1970s uh, japan's rise in the chip industry the book describes a leadership lost so that is from the american perspective so as i said the book is always um, <laughs> so in the 1980s japan challenged us for semiconductor dominance so this is uh, akimori and masaru ibuka so sony um, Sony, uh, a very innovative company. Uh, so companies like Sony was were made possible in Japan because their defense spend was just one percent, and the market was flush with capital, low cost, high production quality. So much so that uh, even American companies started using Japanese chips in the nineteen eighties. So they gained market share in the U.S. the japanese companies so this creates unease in the us all this is described in vivid detail in the book and there is a big uh, war in the photolithography equipment between a company called gca an american company and nikon and ultimately the end loss was to gca the gca is actually gone and the nikon got established at that time as a leader in photolithography so this story is described uh, very nicely in the book so walkman the sony walkman was one of the most popular consumer devices in history innovation at its purest and this was made possible uh, by of course the, the japanese innovation in that era and then of course uh, the america becomes resurgent again so the japan japan becomes uh, dominant in dram so dram is a form of memory okay dynamic ram uh, again uh, you can you can google and find out what is how is dynamic ram different from static ram uh, and uh, what are what are all the differences between sram dram ddr dram dual data rate dram and lp ddr you know low power dual data data rate dram and flash so these are all the kinds of memories um technically again uh, see this is a very important point why this dram market is being spoken as separately because uh, memory if you see is a very repetitive structure right so each cell in a memory so which stores let's say one bit so you just replicate that that becomes let's say a uh, uh, a 512 kb memory or 4 mb memory and you stack multiple such memory chips that will give you 8 mb memory or 8 gb memory right so it it's it's basically a very repetitive structure but the challenges in making the memory chips are very different from making other chips like processors so that's why some companies specialized totally on memory and it is a volume market so so there are many nuances to what makes memories a different kind of chips from the rest 
of course, the analog and power and RF are also somewhat different. And uh, uh, yeah, so so there is a lot of discussion about this DRAM uh, market and DRAM business in the book. So Japan gains this dominance, and then the Intel starts copying Japanese methods, but still they cannot win in the memory market. So they start focusing on microprocessors. And that was well in time for the PC boom. But then another American company, Micron, comes up. So it is an upstart in the potato belt of Idaho. Uh, and interestingly, the founder of this company, I think Jack, Jack uh, Simplon, I forget his name. So he was also a, a potato uh, businessman initially. Uh, so he founds this company and it, it becomes very successful again. So this story is also described very nicely in the book. And then the founding of uh, uh, the, the Samsung, which was founded uh, somewhere around 1938 by Lee Byung-chul in Korea as a, you know, a, a vegetable and uh, other goods trading company. So it enters electronics around this time, around uh, 19, late 1970s, early 1980s, it becomes US ally uh, because it's competitor for Japan, right? So amid these growth challenges in the DRAM market wars, it slowly builds capacity and wins. And again, so they have this motto of saving the nation through business. So there is so much of government money uh, that flew into Samsung in the initial days to make it to such a big and strong company that it is now. Uh, again, by around this time, Russia concedes defeat in the Cold War. Uh, Silicon Valley emerges as a winner. And this nice photograph, it's from the book, uh, the Bill Gates and uh, Andy Grove. So this alliance uh, gives, gave us uh, Windows and, and every other popular computing platforms. Only the paranoid survive. That was Andy Grove's uh, belief. And with this, he saved Intel and, you know, create uh, and paved way for the next, uh, next develop round of developments in the chip industry. Okay, uh, then the book goes on to talks about TSMC. So till now, the manufacturing and the design was happening at one place. Okay, all these companies that we talked about. So when you when you say a semiconductor company, that that also means that they design their chips. They also manufacture their chips. So that's how the norm was. But then uh, Morris Chan of uh, TI he challenged it, and he sets up TSMC in Taiwan. So, and creates what is called a foundry business, which focuses only on manufacturing, which itself, as I showed you, is a very, very complex process. And this creates what is called a fab-less firms. So firms which are chip companies, but which don't have fabs, okay? So, so again, the Taiwan has a conducive business ecosystem and the customer centricity through that, the TSMC grows. So clear leadership emerges in that decade, uh, 90 to 2000, in each supply chain, chain nodes. So semiconductor equipment, package, assembly, everything, there are clear leaders emerging by this time. So Intel happy being a microprocessor, oligopoly, uh, not a, a monopoly still, because there are companies like AMD, uh, even IBM, was making microprocessors around that time. Uh, so Apple iPhone contract goes to Samsung because uh, Intel doesn't want to engage with Apple. So that goes to Samsung and, and then to TSMC. Uh, so if this development had not happened, so the chips for Apple would have been manufactured by Intel, but Intel let that chance go. So 
so by this time china emerges as a leader in electronics assembly but lags in foundry so it creates a company called smic around this time uh, so again the book stress of the point that uh, tsmc really was a project of taiwanese state it's not just a private company tsmc didn't compete with its customers it succeeded if they did so this is how a chip manufacturing got created as a separate business and then so this resulted in more and more offshoring of innovation okay so the foundry model proves a great success so then uh, computing and the chip firms get out or drastically reduce manufacturing like ibm and tvl uh, texas instruments which had very big fabs they all start closing it down uh, why because uh, the, the next next to next slide will give the reasoning new tech firms focus more on innovation so all these are fabulous companies okay nvidia qualcomm or so nvidia makes gpus for 3d graphics now ai qualcomm we already spoke about arm is another interesting company they keep they create processor core designs uh, you know so so the uh, the the processor that we saw in the snapdragon uh, diagram at the start they are arm processors so this is a company which does not manufacture any chip but still it is a, it is a very popular company they just license their processor designs as a intellectual property to every other company uh, in the semiconductor domain who integrate it into their you know chips system on chips socs so so they only produce intellectual property and they verify it by prototyping so obviously there are constant intellectual property disputes in the chip industry so in fact the book describes uh, a intel versus amd war in ip war uh, in in big detail and poaching engineers from one company to the other is also very common uh, so the book has uh, uh, again a good narrative on this company global foundries which came uh, in a big way but but how it failed despite gulf royal money uh so again the intel was lagging at innovation uh because of the emergence uh, with tsmc and samsung emerging ahead intel was kind of getting slow on on the manufacturing front okay this uh, is what i spoke about uh, the extreme ultraviolet lithography um so so this is a biggest technological gamble and the most expensive mass produced machine tool in history okay the book has very good details on this uh, i put this slide just to you know share that uh, uh, the, the excitement about it so there is this company asml uh, which is in netherlands which is the leader in making this equipment so this is the equipment a uh, lithography machine which is used to pattern which is used to draw that circuit pattern uh, on the chip right uh, each for smaller than a human cell so this equipment is made by a company called asml in netherlands each machine costs costs over dollar 100 million and uh, so i have given some details a wavelength of 13.5 nanometer the lasers used in this machine uh, is made by a german company which has this many components the mirrors used in this uh, is made by a swiss company and this equipment has predictive maintenance algorithms to replace components even before they break so this is a quote from book the miracle isn't simply that uv lithography works but that it does so reliably enough to produce chips cost effect effectively so these miraculous tools they are product of many countries hundreds of thousands of parts 
and in fact, the, the, the section, the chapter on uh, this UUV lithography is very well written in the book. Um, okay, so now I'll quickly, uh, I'm coming to the concluding parts of the book. The China emerges as a challenge. So the China was a huge in, importer uh, of chips each year. But it, it made a plan made in China 2025, okay, which, is, which envisaged a reduction in imports drastically to 30%. Vast government subsidies, state-backed theft of trade secrets. So the, the author boldly makes this statement and backs it up with a lot of uh, you know, facts and details, which have already appeared uh, in some news reports, uh, though those uh, industry watchers would know about these. And the ability to access world's second largest consumer market. So these are the strengths of China, really. So through 2010s, many US firms did technology transfers to China. Uh, so because of all these companies like Huawei, one of the most notorious and controversial companies, so there is, there is an interesting narrative about this company uh, in the book, how it came in a big way and how US used all the tricks in its hat to literally isolate and shut it down. Um, so 5G is another, another major uh, technology driver for chips. So this isn't really about phones. It is about the future of computing. And therefore, it is about semiconductors. So again, uh, I just put this quote. So the author gives a, a very good uh, analysis of why he thinks this way. So Tesla, for example, so they have a cult following and plenty of attention uh, because of automated cars and other things. But they are also a leading chip designer. Tesla builds chips specialized for its automated driving needs. Okay, so it is Tesla is also a chip company, really a chip design designing company rather. Okay, so again, uh, the China harnessing the digital technologies for authoritarian purposes. So this is also described in the book. Chip choke. So this is kind of the last chapter of the book. I just put some quotes um, from this. If Tokyo and Washington agreed they could make it impossible for any firm in any country to make advanced chips. Weaponized interdependence. So, so this is a term that the author has coined. The process of offshoring chip fabrication had coincide, coincided with a growing monopolization of chip industry choke points. And Huawei, once a, a big company, simply cut off from the world's entire chip making infrastructure, followed by blacklisting multiple other Chinese tech firms. So, so this is exactly what gives way to the title, chip war. Uh, the sh semiconductor shortage that is uh, uh, spoken about a lot these days, it's a demand growth rather than a supply issue. Okay, so there is really, uh, there are no problems on the supply side really. In fact, the demand is driven by new PCs, 5G, AI, uh, our demand for computing power. So TSMC's chairman, so he, he says that no one wants to disrupt the semiconductor supply chains, but everyone wants to control these supply chains. So that's what is the conclusion of this book. Um, I told you why some of the, the old big semiconductor companies are closing down their manufacturing facilities. The reason is this, the most advanced logic chip manufacturing facility, it costs twice as much as an aircraft carrier, no, not a commercial aircraft, an aircraft carrier, but it will be cutting edge only for a couple of years. So even Pentagon style budget is not big enough to afford this. So only a company like TSMC, uh, 
which is manufacturing chips for almost every leader in the industry can invest so much money in sustaining the manufacturing process and constantly improving it. Uh, the complexity of producing computing power. So this again, uh, he says that the story of Silicon Valley is not just a story of science or engineering. Technology advances when it finds a market. The history of the semiconductor is also a story of sales, marketing, supply chain management, everything. Uh, so AI has become more general purpose that, that we all know with chat GPT and everything. Have we reached a peak in the computing power a chip can cost effectively produce? No, that's, that's what many thousands of engineers <laughs> are betting. <clears throat> So still improvements are possible. So key takeaways from the book. Um, so most advanced chips are designed in the US, fabricated at, in Taiwan via machinery supplied by ASML in Netherlands. So these are some statistics. So TSMC fabricates 37% of the world's new computing power, okay? Two Korean companies produce 44% of the world's memory chips. So this we already talked about, US and Japan can make irreplaceable machinery for production. ASML has 100% share on the UUV lithography. Uh, it's a highly interdependent system. It's a closed loop system because the cost and complexity make even strong players to struggle and fail. So this is what is called chip war. So the growing trade, economic and military tensions between US and China with Taiwan caught in the middle. So US counters China through many sanctions, you know, uh, like chip act, uh, preventing US companies from transferring technology, exporting chips and all that. But it allows China to retain ability to make some lower end chips because that helps the US, not beyond. So more resilience into the global chip supply chains it is expensive and may take years. So now that we have come this far, you might be wondering what is there for India in this whole thing? So this is my last but one slide. Uh, Ramanan uh, Badri, do I have some five more minutes? Yeah, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Okay, so I spoke a lot about manufacturing. You may be wondering uh, what is there in design, right? So, so I just put this one slide for two reasons. One is because chip design process is something which is kind of like software development in a sense. And I thought many people would be interested in this. And I am a chip designer, essentially. My, my area of work is chip design, okay? Whatever I spoke till now is to give you a feel of the book and the chip industry, but this is really something related to my work. Um, so a chip design process involves multiple stages that require varied engineering skills and innovation depending on the complexity of the chip design. So I just put a, a flow chart here. So you start with the concept, okay? Just like any software, any tool, any product. And then of course you create a specifications architecture. What kind of chip it is? Is this chip, is it a, is it a processor? Is it a smartphone uh, chip? It's uh, like that, right? And then of course you create uh, the chip architecture. So what do you do here? A lot of analysis, a lot of block diagram work, a lot of modeling. So you need to really model uh, the chip using some high level sophisticated tools. Um, and then you create what is called a functional design. Okay, so in at this level, you are not at all worrying about transistors or gigahertz or how much power a chip is going to consume, nothing. You are still talking about, okay, processor, memory, you know, audio, video, uh, like that. 
so you design the blocks uh, and then you integrate all of them so uh, something called a hardware description language or hdl is used here you know system very long uh, is a hdl language and then you verify this design at the functional level um so you do simulations again there are many uh, and you do prototyping and you fix any bugs in the design so that's why this arrow is there so you go back so you can fix uh, you can keep doing this verification again and again you can go fix the bugs in the design if there are some bugs in the concept itself you can go back and fix it so there are languages for verification so there is a language called system verilog there are tools there are methodologies there are platforms so this is simulation you can also prototype the chip at this stage you know it it will run slow but still there are some hardware platforms uh, on which you can prototype just to ensure that the proof of concept that the, just just, just um, give me a minute i have a urgent interruption Uh, please stay yeah. on and uh, sorry sorry about that yeah. yeah i'm back okay so and then you come to physical design uh so where you you basically synthesis so this process is called synthesis so you you convert this logical design into a chip layout and there are some stages here like floor planning place and route uh, design for test and manufacture and then you do a physical verification so you, here is where you start worrying about how fast the chip will run uh, and uh, you know electrical thermal checks so all this can be done in a design center okay you don't have to go to taiwan or any manufacturing facility or anywhere but these tools are very very expensive uh, and then you sign off and release to the fab you release the final chip layout and you don't do do everything from the scratch as you know so there are a lot of pre designed and licensed intellectual properties there are libraries there are design rules so so the, the fab will give you all the things necessary so that when you design this chip and give give the layout to them they can give you a working chip back so this is how the manufacturing and the design got decoupled okay so so if there is uh, some interest in this forum i can give a very detailed talk on chip design process itself uh, i just wanted to introduce this uh, in this talk so that's why so what are the goals in your design so it's a it's a multi variable optimization for a chip area uh, you know how big is the chip what is the speed what is the power so there are standard procedures and working interfaces between the design house and the fab okay india and semiconductors so india had uh, some decent electronics and computer hardware design and manufacturing setup by 1990s early 90s so there were defense and other government labs hcl wipro so if you remember uh, hcl and wipro used to make their own computers uh, bpl videocon and then there were c dot c dac ecil some of these ecil still uh, they are some of them are alive and there were fabs uh, a very uh, early uh, you know fabs in indian telephone industry semiconductor complex limited bharat electronics so bel still makes some very very simple chips none of them state of the art uh, that goes into electronic voting machine for example <clears throat> so some of these infrastructure is still alive but in the post liberalization era hardware imports eased greatly to give philip to the it industry focused on software software applications and services uh, so that so this led to the near closure of all indian hardware manufacturing so we started importing electronics like crazy but 
still the chip design skills and experience of indian indian engineers are being utilized because the global chip companies have established their design houses in india so companies like ti intel qualcomm broadcom all these companies and also some startup with a, a typically indian founded startup and bengaluru is one city uh, where a lot of this has happened uh, there are also outsourced projects to chip design services companies so it is called uh, engineering r and d and startups located so this is also a, a major part of the ecosystem you know so post 2014 there is this make in india initiative uh, for reducing electronics imports so assembly plants of many global electronic companies established to meet domestic demands and also some exports so major tech players are invited to set up semicon fab uh, in india with attractive like vedanta foxconn micron so courses in colleges are getting announced to create engineering workforce for fab operations so we already have a lot of good design chip design talent but the the engineering skills necessary for manufacturing that is something which india doesn't have and the government uh, has started courses on this front as well i think i took a bit more time uh, i had a lot to cover so with this i conclude my presentation uh thank you jeta you if you could uh, close the presentation then we both can come on to the screen uh right okay uh wonderful there are there are more questions it's a it's a topic which uh, yes a few of us understand from a uh, the commercial aspect see in a sense i understand that um, uh, any kind of manufacturing is difficult let's take a slightly related issue we don't manufacture aircraft in our country right i mean we have hindustan aeronautics for a long time struggling right right uh, fair amount of money has been put in it is it's a fairly uh, you know it's a it's a mechanical engineering problem we have models but you know there still commercially manufacturing either a fighter plane or uh, a passenger airplane seems to be a very 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 difficult one and there are only about three four companies in the world uh, who do this right? right you keep hearing boeing you keep hearing airbus then right. empire and then that's it in terms of slightly larger aircraft right now let's take this one and i'll i'll ask you know there are few questions from the audience and i have many many questions hmm. let us ask that i think uh, ram ji had also asked this question i'm i'm just paraphrasing it uh do we even have to bother about making this in india uh -huh. let, let me complete this and then you can answer this right right uh, for example ram ji asks will it be economically profitable to start a chip manufacturing company in india or will it be preferred to import the chips now we are importing it now you tell me what the answer is and why we should even be concerned about this yeah see one is okay being a very populous country right so so why is china trying to do this because they they are world's second largest market hmm right right so such a populous country and you know so so gold used to be our number one import mm. uh followed by a uh, number two import followed by oil i think okay oil is of course the top and i think in the last 3 uh, 4 years back actually electronics over to gold okay so the electronics is what we are importing next to oil and unlike oil you know which is related to uh, natural reserves and other things mm -hmm. electronics is something which is a technology so technically you can uh, do something to reduce your electronics imports so the real goal should be to reduce electronics imports it's not like of course the chip chip manufacturing is one major component of it assembly for example right so yeah. i i in the last slide i mentioned about the post 2014 developments uh, about the electronic assemblies 
so which is not really chip manufacturing but assembling right. a mobile phone for example which, even that yeah which is already happening in a big way happening. right now in india right exactly uh, so so we were not focusing even on those fronts right but now uh, the solar panel assembly for example right uh, so so that would go a very big so see why the government is government and everyone is so much behind on it because mm. they they really want to reduce the quantum of electronics imports is it just that is it just an import issue or is there something more strategic about it you know we are always I, afraid that there could be a spionage there could be so many other things right right see security um, so in the last slides uh, i talked about the security leakage and espionage kind of issues right mm. Mm. so so there are there are uh, whenever a, uh, a country uses a lot of imported chips mm. uh, any imported technology for that matter in some very sensitive and strategic areas okay uh, there is always a fear uh, of security security see take take one example uh, the evm which i spoke about right right so india's evm machine by its sheer simplicity and low tech nature uh -huh. is uh, free of any such security threat in fact uh, in in uh, there is an ietrly paper hmm. on why it is near impossible to hack indian evm why because it is first of all it is a very passive device hmm. uh, it it is just a eprom actually uh, electronic programmable memory yeah, i guess not not connected to any uh, yeah, work it, or anything nothing right so so yeah. so i think uh, we are keeping that uh, deliberately a very low tech but indig indigenously manufactured electronics because of a reason mm -hmm. so uh, so obviously so in the defense uh, in in any other uh, see we are talking about data localization now right so so government is always concerned about uh, any crucial technology uh, imported especially from countries like china uh, being deployed uh, in our crucial uh, you know networks and infrastructure and the government so that is that is also one aspect to this okay okay so uh, now we'll uh, look at uh, you know there is another question from ramji which you have answered Uh, but i'll ask again uh, uh, for the benefit of everyone who wants to know if someone wants to start a chip making company in india mm -hmm. what is the minimum investment that will be required and i want to add a supplementary question to that mm -hmm. vedanta uh, had announced that uh, in uh, association with uh, foxconn mm. they wanted to start something but then mm. it also broke down that right right now can you combine these two questions and uh, so if we have to start a chip fundamental chip making not any uh, assembly or anything like that yeah. see uh, it, it 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 all depends on um whether first of all uh, as i said uh, in the last slide if you had uh, noticed i had put that dollar 900 billion right, right so you right. know the see uh, the stay uh, i think about the it all depends on whether you if you want to do state of the art or not so if you want to make let us say a 250 nanometer foundry mm -hmm. which is so outdated now mm -hmm. perhaps uh, some universities uh, can may even have some small scale fab like that where okay. where you right i think iit madras already has a fab where uh, some things can be ma manufactured but mm -hmm. what what is what is even the commercial viability of such a see if you cannot make chips for let's say smartphone or a laptop which are the things that are uh, that are the that form the huge chunk of your imports what is even the point of having a fab with a, a technology node which is five generations behind you can still create some chips that work hmm but ultimately it it is it is not a sound economics mm. because companies like tsmc though they have a they they have a whole array of manufacturing setup 
mm. where they can they can manufacture state of the art chips and also you know chips of a few older technology nodes okay because because it it all calls for the same infrastructure isn't it right right <laughs> yeah so so that way uh, it, it's it's a beyond it, it's a multi multi billion dollar investment and see even i don't have an idea it, it, it's a very difficult question to even answer how much does it cost to set it up right mm. can but i add one thing chip design is something mm. where india already has a lot of strength skills mm. and and india can see the, the right question to ask is why india is not creating fabulous companies see mm. why india is not creating companies like nvidia Or mm. ARM, or even Qualcomm. Right. So Qualcomm doesn't own Fab. You can always go to TSMC to get your chips manufactured. Right. 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 See, I put that flow chart essentially because I I didn't have time. Uh, it's very I have put so many things in that. Mm. I just put that slide to create um, a curiosity around it. I mm. I can give a full fledged talk. on chip design and what it involves mm-hmm. and in fact if there are entrepreneurial people uh, among the listeners they can actually think of creating a chip design service as startup mm-hmm. okay see if you it not chip design startup as such because chip design startup would mean your next nvidia or next arm right okay. so basically let's say you take outsourced project from intel Mm. or qualcom some small module in one big chip design mm. in that I, i put that flow chart right? right so specialize on let's say two boxes of that flow chart because they all need specialized uh, skill and engineering and everything right and uh, uh, someone can there are quite a few people who have created such startup services companies in fact one such company uh, sankhya labs it it kind of became a product company Okay. Okay. they made they uh, off late uh, they have gone a bit down uh, but they had a run for something like 10 years close to mm-hmm. that uh, sankhya labs okay uh, they, they actually uh, made a few chips uh, for the wireless infrastructure okay uh, ramanan you had a question uh, uh, my observation is that on, this is on starting a chip fab right my observation is that uh, if you look at uh, uh, Taiwan or uh, South Korea or now China, the government contribution, right, via uh, subsidy and uh, other means. Okay, when I say other means, it can even be coercion, which China is uh, very, very well done. Okay, so it it to a great extent contributes to even putting a company in place. China has failed. Uh, you know, you just mentioned one name. They did try. they did get lot of uh, ip but still they failed okay? they they couldn't compete with uh, tsmc so uh, the first point is does it really uh, is it is it feasible without a government uh, subsidy or government coming in the big way is the indian is the indian government ready for it and the second part is even if we put in all that money does it really make commercial sense Yeah, see, that's what I answered in the beginning. Also, right? Uh, we are again coming to the same point. So, of course, the the huge capital is needed, okay? Uh, and government, just like the space program, so the government needs to put. But one thing, if if uh, if you if you had noticed the slides or if you have read the book, uh, there was there was a window uh, when all these state-sponsored chip industry bring up. was hugely successful it was in the 70s 80s and the 90s right unfortunately india missed that window mm. see uh, you remember that photograph of uh, uh, ladies assembling in the electronics assembly in malaysia what was india doing at that time so india could have gone into the electronics hardware orbit by that time but unfortunately uh, we didn't have governments uh we, you know we uh, there was the, see all these companies samsung uh, sony um tsmc every one of these east asian companies they they 
they, they were almost like gov, um, a complete government and uh, national projects mm. for those countries. So, so, in fact, the book has much details about this whole thing. Yes. And, and India missed that window. Now, see, now the technology has become extremely complicated. Mm. And now if you are entering it, you have to enter at, a, let us say, a 10 nanometer fab. I mean... <laughs> so, what, 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 what do we do? For example, one possibility is mm -hmm. we are a large market. Uh, and we can even now start small with whatever it is. See, end yes. of the day, when we were uh, importing uh, mobile phones like crazy from China and from South Korea, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, it's a much simpler assembly. is a much simpler operation. Yes. You, uh, you know, uh, opportunity came. Uh, iPhone assembly started happening in India. Non-iPhone, the other uh, Android phones also started getting assembled here. Yes, we have changed it around, and there is a significant, uh, you know, uh, investment from not from local. I mean, again, it is the Foxconns, again, it is the uh, you know Vistrons, and uh, now I think Tata is entering by buying out Vistron. So yeah, basically, you are entering that particular area somehow because things have to change, right? There could be cost advantages, there could be local markets, you can tinker with the export-import uh, tariff, so yeah. as to give a certain skewed advantage to local manufacturing. Now, local manufacturing means technology is learned here, applied here, machines come here, high-end engineering happens here. Like, for example, you know, you are part of a design uh, of chips, right? So there is considerable design capability. Right. Already in India. Yes. I know that uh, cutting edge chips are designed in India. Absolutely, yes. Fabbed elsewhere and then sold back to India. That's right. a current scenario, right? Yeah. So See, that is true with most of the countries. Right. How, how many countries in the world have yeah. chip manufacturing? Right. In the US at one point of time had, uh, you know, uh, the, the entire cities uh, which came up because of the semiconductor firm. Fab. In fact, when, when I used to work at IBM, mm. I used to visit the state of Vermont, up okay. north. Uh, so the, the whole city of Vermont really saw a big progress because IBM started putting their fabs there. Okay. Uh, the, I think Burlington, yes. Okay. That was the name of the city. But of, uh, in the last 15-20 years, almost every other company in the US is closing their fabs. Okay. No, I, I, talking of which, Shantala has a question. Yeah. Of late, we hear of US wanting to set up chip fabrication within the US <laughs> to overcome dependency on outsourced companies like TSMC. Yes, yes. Any info on that or is that even feasible? Is what she is asking. US might do it. Uh, see, it is not that they have to set up new, right? In fact, uh, Intel already has th their fabs. It is, see, it is not that they have given it up, right? Companies like IBM, anyway, consciously moved away from hardware, right? right. So that so it became a services company. Uh, at one point of time, IBM used to make everything yeah. from uh, the monitors to printers to whatnot. Yes. Right. So the company, the whole company moved away. So, the, but still, they actually have fabs. They have not closed all their fabs because they were one of the very early pioneers of semiconductor technology. They okay. still make some chips for their supercomputers. By the right. way. Right. In their own fabs, which okay. are located in the US. It is just that. So, so the technical capability is kind of there, but uh, they, they simply can't scale uh, mm. and they don't want to in a commercial space because mm. they, they just can't compete with GSMC. Right. So, uh, talking of which, Rajesh Ganesan points out that there are fabs used for academic purposes at IISC and IIT Mumbai. And he says he has the he had the opportunity to visit one in IAST. So mm -hmm. fab capabilities are here even uh, in India. No, no, university more for fabs, academic, uh? Yeah, yeah. The university fabs are much much small scale. Right. And uh, uh, not commercial. See that a commercial semiconductor fab is a completely different ball game. Mm. I mean, uh, 
see uh, uh, in fact i didn't even touch even a tip of that iceberg uh, okay. if if you had seen the slides that i had put mm. you would know how how complex that whole process is i just wanted to drive the point in fact even in fact i gave more technical details than what is there in the book mm. because the book is largely a business uh, book right and mm. the, the kind of physics chemistry optics precision machine tooling and the equipment the cost of the equipment mm. see for example some even if you are ready to pay for the equipment mm. you might have to sign a lot of agreements mm. Mm. Uh, to to i don't know how many equipments you would need to buy from how many places right to, to set up a working fab okay a couple of, a couple of questions uh, uh, from my side okay apart from the uh, you know the technical know how and stuff like that yeah right 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 how many <laughs> how many years if you assume we get somehow get the money and the government backing how many years does it take to get it off the ground See, it's not a matter of time. See, that's why they are trying to get partners, right? If it's, it's impossible for India to start and do it now, so I think Micron oh, yeah. had uh, Micron had expressed interest. I think that mm. that that uh, that discussion is still on, mm. right? So if the Micron Micron puts up a fab, uh, I think they were looking at Gujarat, uh, if I remember. Uh, so even if a DRAM fab comes. it it is a it's, it's not a simple thing see dram uh, i mean for a for a geeky technical guy oh okay dram looks like a very repetitive structure what is there in memory <laughs> but in terms of uh, the, the overall chip technology thing i mean uh, a country getting a, a state of the art dram fab is a very big thing okay so if the micron uh, uh, discussion succeeds uh, which is very good so let's wish that it succeeds i think government has given them a lot of uh, uh, sops uh, okay yeah uh, the a couple of questions uh, one is uh, from vk srinivasan uh, is two questions uh, uh, but the second one is uh, more interesting what are the environmental factors that need to be considered in the chip manufacturing waste disposal water and land contamination supply of rare metals is this process net positive for the world uh i think given the overall uh, what can we live without chips number yeah. one see even the environmental activists post their messages <laughs> using their mobile phones right uh, so we have reached a point where it is impossible to live without computers which means without chips mm. okay and okay. Uh, the yellow okay and uh, the materials technology we are seeing continuous uh, good improvements in the material technology associated with electronics overall not just chips see for example moving from the crt tubes to flat panels okay that itself was such a environmentally positive move i don't know if if any of you have seen those old style tvs mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right the, yeah. the, the kind of plastic and the kind of uh, toxic uh, materials that would go into those kind of tubes right and we have from there we moved to uh, flat panels so so every user who is using any device will have a display right right so so we move first we move to a uh, regular um, uh, lcd and plasma based flat panel displays and from there now we moved to oled kind of materials which are actually environmentally better they are more durable okay so this is one example uh, battery technology is another one where there is lot of research going on in trying to you know degrade the um, uh, environmental damage mm -hmm. okay uh, uh, in the chip manufacturing in terms of pollution and waste disposal chip manufacturing is not even in the first 10 most polluting industries 
and yeah, obviously also, with the chemicals and uh, <laughs> manufacturing and leather and i know there are so many more uh, yes. polluting uh, industries anyway yeah. like, See, maybe uh, the feeder industries right uh, so some of the feeder uh, industries into chip manufacturing uh, that is where a lot of this chemistry related work is done right there are many observations from on v ramakrishnan because he is from the industry or knows fair bit of it so he is saying you need to lose money on the investment of a few fab say 10 billion dollars then there could be an ecosystem created for future potential successful companies he also says foxconn has no history of running a wafer wafer fab true it seemed very strange that they enter this market in partner with another who has no basis of anything to do with electronics he has two more observations which i will mention and then you can add your comments singapore spent so much money on propping up chartered semiconductor yes. but he gave up when it was bleeding and yeah, that's uh, also he, described in the book in fact the singapore story is also mm. briefly described in the book yeah and uh, finally india would be better served by starting to manufacture specialty materials like high purity chemicals gases etc even wafer manufacturing so your comments on this yeah see there. this is this is a very good thought in fact uh, uh-huh. yeah again I, i am not from a business background right okay. so i am a technologist so but what he says is very right so instead of trying to do you know go all the way to chip manufacturing mm-hmm. identify identify some of the so he said uh, the wafer, wafer uh, what was that wafer manufacturing right yeah yeah so i said so I, you know basically high purity chemicals gases etc yes, exactly. and even wafer manufacturing yes so this how the sand the sand becomes the wafer right. right so that is actually the starting step for chip manufacturing but that itself involves so much of things a lot of right. material science okay. uh, a lot of chemistry uh, and other things so and india with uh, a long coastlines where i think industrial sand uh, is probably available uh, in many patches see already we have the sand mining mafias right uh, depleting our river beds for house construction right <laughs> but the the semiconductor fabs might need much uh, less quantity of <laughs> sand compared to correct, that correct correct okay uh, but but it might need a, a lot of uh, phys- physics chemistry material science oriented mm-hmm. um, factory setup in yeah. which india might already have some strength see the, the good thing about his suggestion is that india perhaps already has a lot of industries you know which can serve as feeders right at various stages in the semiconductor manufacturing process mm. which we have not uh, much explored perhaps okay so uh, so question from anand soumitran uh, do you think a lot of ai algo will be implemented in chips and things like neuralink will be possible in india also any info about uh, kamakoti uh, of iit madras uh, indigenous para 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 shakti or para shakti chip okay will ai algorithms be implemented in chips uh, no no see, see i gave the example of the mp4 algorithm you know at the start of the presentation just to give right. you a glimpse right of, so so things moving into hardware always gives a performance boost right so just to drive that point i gave that example hmm. so when you say ai algorithms i mean that itself is a very complex word right right okay so what would be implemented in the hardware is for example some some repetitive operations which if performed in software mm. Mm. would either cause a time lag or you know would be very uh, or would consume a lot of power and things like that for example if most of the ai algorithm does um, if many ai algorithms do let us say uh, a specific form of matrix multiplication okay or mm. they do what is called uh, a convolution operation mm. okay or they do some transform like fast fourier transform of something whatever 
Mm-hmm. So, so if you if a if a if a company thinks that by moving that operation into hardware, right, and parallelizing it, every one of their AI algorithms will run faster, right? Mm. So such things are the ones which will get into hardware. Mm. See, this is a very very uh, nuanced technical point. So unless uh, you know you are familiar with uh, a hardware software partitioning. Mm. kind of uh, thing right so so when you right. design a system so when you really think from a system perspective you have a application mm. you would actually start from uh, putting what to put in hardware what to put in software right so those things will get into uh, the chips they have already got into chips in fact nvidia's uh, some of the nvidia's chips right have right. some very sophist- very sophisticated mathematical operations which were previously used for graphics rendering okay mm. so so mm. the real beauty is that uh, whatever mathematical operations were used by nvidia for 3d graphics rendering right they repurposed the same kind of things for ai algorithms mm-hmm. because at a mathematical level they both are similar right okay yeah. so okay. regarding the shakti processor i don't know uh, we need to ask kamakoti where they are <laughs> sure okay, um, but we but we one last question from me yeah yeah uh, i was speaking to a relative the other day and he was complaining he works in embedded uh, area and uh, again close to three decades okay? so he was complaining that uh, the manpower available okay, is very limited and you, you go across companies it is very limited and he was also complaining in a manner that we we learn c and c++ then they went to java now everyone is start python so the level of abstraction is lost and uh, i don't know whether our education system has to relook at uh, going back to c or c++ so that we have more people so i just want to know what jada you think about this uh see we we would need all kinds of people really okay um so coming to chip design um, you know if you had uh, we didn't uh, we couldn't spend much time on that flow chart of the chip design process mm. so so many of much of chip verification for example is like software okay mm. I, i i made a mention of verification languages right yeah. uh, system very long for example it's actually a object oriented language okay mm. in fact uh, a good a cs engineering graduate can uh, is a very good fit for a chip verification team in fact mm-hmm. he doesn't need to know anything about transistors or mm-hmm. uh, gigahertz or any of whatever we spoke about silicon <laughs> or lithography or anything okay so because see ultimately when you want to design a new chip right so let us say you, you want to design a ai processor or a smartphone processor the the front end portion of the chip design is almost like software right mm. Mm. it's Correct. just that you need to have that kind of engineering skills orientation mm. right yes so 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 we we can actually take very good cs engineers and they can work in so only the physical design if if you remember mm. the flow chart Hmm. so there was concept there was logical design there was verification yeah, yeah. and then there was physical design physical and physical design. verification so the physical design and physical verification would certainly need a uh, hardcore electronics knowledge so because you are creating the chip layout right so you need to know voltage current so uh, as you go go down my understanding yes. is that as you go down there is more abstraction that is needed yes, exactly. so you how to think in a certain manner uh, and uh, he was actually ca- complaining that people are going to aws and those kind of things because they get to go abroad but whereas reality if yeah, you see, see that's how it is right this, uh, yeah that's uh, because most of the job opportunity uh, is in those kind of domains so y- even the chip design companies right so the, uh, i i mentioned uh, i made a mention of a few chip design companies right hmm. so predominantly it is the electronics and communication electrical and uh, electronics graduates Mm. um who come into these companies yeah okay and depending on their interest see some some of them will have more 
um, electronics orientation. They, they get into physical design type of jobs. Mm. Mm. So others who are kind of uh, have a, a more towards programming, right? More towards digital mm. uh, logic kind of thing. So they will get into that front end portion of the chip design. Okay. So, 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 so embedded systems is another area where you need actually uh, more of a hardware, some kind of a hardware understanding, but mm. not at the chip level. Mm. Okay. So it is more at the system level. So you, you get a board, right? So what an embedded system designer would normally do. So he will get a prototyping board or he will actually even develop a product which will mm. essentially be a board. It yeah. will have a few chips. It, it will have, perhaps it will have one big SOC. It will yeah. have a couple of, it will have some large memory. It will have a couple of sensors, yeah. right? And a few other devices like USB or, or some very specific things. So if it's a medical thing, so some, some interface connecting to your medical instrumentation stuff. So he needs to understand hardware at that level. So that's what is the knowledge required to work in an embedded uh, system uh, project. In fact, it doesn't require any knowledge about chip uh, manufacturing or even chip design for that matter. So, uh, are, we, are, are we today, um, by taking our kids uh, uh, Python and Java, are we preparing them for uh, something more abstract? I am, I am a bit concerned about it. My son is learning Python, but I'm not good, sure whether- Good for him. You know what? <laughs> By the way, uh, actually, Python is also being uh, emerging as one of the major chip verification languages. Okay. See, people who were developed because with, if you want, if when you want to functionally verify the chip, right, you mm. need to simulate it, right? So, so mm. you you have this chip design, uh, which is more like a it it the chip design code is written in a hardware description language, okay, and you have simulators. Uh, which can take that as the input, simulate and show you how, how the chip works. You need to do a lot of modeling, mm. right? So, so see, if you are creating some image sensor or any chip, you need to create a model which will give input to this chip, right? Yeah. And you all, and the outputs given by the chip, you need to validate that through a model. So all these models were get being created in a language like system very loud so mm. far. But now people are saying, why do we need yet another language for this? We can actually create these models in Python. Python, okay. Because languages like Python have what is called a notion of a cycle. You know, see, you have a clock in a chip, right? So everything happens at a clock edge. Mm. So if, through some software language, if you can create, um, uh, if you can model something, a, a synchronous system that keeps doing every one of its execution at a clock edge, let us say. You can use that language somewhere in the chip design or verification process. Yeah. Okay. So that's how Python is coming into it, by the way. Okay. Good to know that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 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 Ramanan, uh, we have taken uh, close yes. to two hours. Uh, we, I'm sure, you know, we can keep asking uh, many, many more questions. Uh, I will close it with one question because I don't want to miss anybody's question here. Harish Kamath has a question. How does Chipwar impact the internet in terms of the optic fiber cables, undersea cables, or even Starlink satellites? Is there even any connection that you want to see? How? I don't think so. Mm. At least uh, in the book, which is very meticulously researched on mm. such topics. Mm. There is really no mention about the internet infrastructure okay. getting affected. See, because wrecking that would prove to be a disaster for everyone. Right. Who would who might even want to do that? Unless the, there are some antisocial kind of elements mm. who really want to create some chaos mm. in the society. That kind of... Uh, but some selective sabotage of internet infrastructure is possible, which might still be happening. Okay. Maybe not, not underlying C table, you know, so suddenly 
shut the internet in in one particular city no i guess uh, his question is not as much about such kind of uh, uh, you know sabotage mm. maybe you know by i'm just can trying to connect optic fiber cables undersea cables mm-hmm. and starlink satellites see for example if um, you know uh, one or a new technology for data transfer may make some of the older ones completely obsolete kind of a thing right or, yeah but i, I really what, don't what he had in mind yeah Maybe i i really don't that. think you know we have we are people are even thinking of alternatives for yeah. those things yeah okay right. uh, i think i think we have we have spent a lot of time it's fascinating maybe he, maybe he has some futuristic thing in mind i know but which is which is perhaps <laughs> not at all connected to chip or semiconductor manufacturing uh, in maybe at or, least or, or i have not understood what he had in mind just yeah. one comment and i'll close with that uh, this um, a person called thenjal uh, saying scl chandigarh fabricated processor for chandrayaan 3 in 180 nanometer uh, node just for info and mm-hmm. harish kamath uh, has uh, then uh, added to that saying chandrayaan mangalyaan satellites did use made in bharat chips for their equipment the just yeah. information yeah. Yes. absolutely see that's what i uh, so 180 nanometer is still useful for making working chips okay absolutely yeah, yeah. Uh, wonderful uh, so i you know we have taken a lot of your time thank you uh, yeah. thank you uh, jetayu for an uh, excellent um, introduction to this topic i hope uh, you know more uh, teachers uh, go through this St- they just show it to their students uh, ask them to go through this which will help them to go and approach the book and read it also yeah. but uh, getting an idea about uh, very crucial topics such as this uh, will help them even make a decision in terms of whether they should consider electronics the usual thing of i'll go into computer science coding etc but yeah. move a little bit away and also consider seriously chip design given yes. its uh, importance to uh, country strategic uh, yes you know, uh, a position yes. as well as economic importance i think uh, this session could possibly help some of them uh, we will certainly fact, uh, more. yeah see as i offered at the end uh, i am actually willing to give a full fledged one hour talk on chip no, design no, we'll do that we will do that we will do In that fact, chip design is a topic which will be comprehensible for uh, as anybody with uh, some basic you know electronics computer science background okay programming yeah. background also yeah i am willing i i can i can yeah we will do that i mean we will schedule we will uh, uh, talk to you again and uh, you know fix up a session uh, thank you once again uh, jitayu for an uh, excellent uh, overall uh, presentation uh, nicely summed up not just the book the, the introduction before we could get into the book uh, that's re- that was really helpful and um, uh, you know we would obviously want you Uh, more often to cover uh, more topics thank you thank you, thank you. thanks ramana thank you, thank you from uh, marami rasens forum you thank want you. to add anything ramana nothing okay thank you thanks bye bye